I look at how important the Bible is, and yet the Bible has been used in such destructive ways down through history. I mean, the Pharisees could quote the first five books of the Bible from memory, and yet they're resisting what God's doing. What changes that is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I thought about, you know, while we were worshiping, I thought about what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in the last days, very difficult times are going to come. And as we were worshiping, the Holy Spirit said, keep going, John. And I realized what came next in that chapter. I didn't put it together until we were in worship this morning. But listen to what Paul continues to say, this young man, Timothy. He said, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've had some amazing teachers in this church. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood. And they've given you the wisdom to receive salvation that comes through trusting in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired, now listen to this, by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. You know, I've written 22 books now in almost 30 years of writing. It has, it's 30 years this year is when I began writing. And yet, if you talk to our four sons, they will say, when we get up in the morning, we see dad's light on in a study and he's in the scriptures. And there is a reason for that. Because the writer of Hebrews makes a statement that rivets me. In Hebrews chapter four, verse one, he said, we must pay very careful attention to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. Now, as a young man who used to fish in White Lake, Michigan, I remember that there were times that I was so excited about fishing, I would forget to put down the anchor. And I'm so excited about fishing that a few minutes later, 30 minutes later, I look up and I don't even recognize where I'm at. And the reason is I drifted. Drifting never happens consciously, it happens unconsciously. I remember Lisa and I were, we were treated to a place called Londolozi. It's a, a game reserve in Africa. And the pastors that took us there, we were speaking for his conference. Was, and just an unbelievable place. There were no fences. Um, we were staying in a villa that was a distance from the main camp. And I remember the road that led us out to our villa at night. Boy, when it gets dark over there, it's dark. There's no city lights anywhere. And I remember that guy had a flashlight and he was showing Lisa and I the path on how to get to our villa to sleep for the night. And I do remember this, this is kind of funny, a side note. He said, don't you dare walk out of your place tonight unless you call us. And then he started telling us about the lady recently that was killed. He said, this is, you're in the jungle and nighttime is when these guys come out, okay? So, you know, he put enough fear in us that we stayed in our place all night. But anyway, I'll, I'll never forget that flashlight is the only light anywhere. And I thought to myself, if he turned that flashlight off, we're completely off that path and we'll have no idea where we're at and we're gonna fall into some ditch or something like this. All that to say that God says, thy word is a lamp unto our feet, it's a light unto our path. And Jesus makes the statement to give us daily bread. We don't live off of what God said yesterday, we live off of what God's saying today. So I have, I have shared with our sons and our team members, when I get in the word of God in the mornings, I will never read that Bible without asking the Holy Spirit to open my eyes and teach me. It is so important that we ask him to teach us because the letter kills. If scripture can be used in a way to really hurt people, but the spirit gives life. You know, there were some publishers that came, they wanted us to sign a book deal with them. They were evangelical publisher. And I remember I sat down with them at lunch and I just started opening up and, and, and you know, just sharing from my heart. 
And after I had left, they looked at my assistant and they said, he must spend hours and hours and hours and hours studying. They said, we do an hour and a half after work three times a week and just the word that comes out of him. And I remember the next day, my, my assistant said that to me and I said, nah. I said, you know what the difference is? I've, I know the teacher. And I guess the reason I'm kind of saying this right now is we live in a world that has, that pulls on us from every direction. We have a world not only pulls on us, but is putting things in our face constantly. I mean, back in the 1970s, I think they said that we would get from billboards, magazines, television about, I think it was... If the, and, and you can't quote me on this because it's been a while since I heard this. We got about 350 bits of information, major bits of information per day. Today, it's over 6,000. So we're constantly being bombarded from the world. Now, you have to realize that when Paul makes this statement, I will press on to the high call. Press means what? It doesn't mean you just kind of tiptoe to the high call, it means you have to resist the resistance. That there is an opposition for you moving into the high calling. What is the high calling? Does anybody know what the high calling is? It's to know him intimately. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection being made conformable to his death. So in order to become like him, that's the goal of God. You do realize that. What is the end game for Christianity? It's to be conformed to the image of his dear son. So there is going to be resistance that will try to hinder you from becoming like him. And that's why we, I I commend you. Here we are on a Saturday morning, yet you're still out here. Why? Because you want to hear the word of God. You want to hear the scriptures taught. This is why Paul says to Timothy in the very next verse, preach the word. But he doesn't say it haphazardly. He says, I charge you in the sight of God and Jesus Christ, who will judge the living of the dead, preach the word. Okay, now, what's interesting is Rick Renner sat down and and really elaborated on this with me one day. He said, son, he said, John, excuse me. He said, John, this word charge in the Greek, so this is chapter four. You gotta continue three into four because the whole thing is one letter. The church put the chapters and verses in later. He said, this word charge is a word that was only used in the Greek culture when elders were appointing an official or a council member to a city, to a governmental position of a local city, and they would all call on the Greek gods, and they said, we charge you to do exactly what we're telling you to do, or the Greek gods, all these gods will judge you. Paul uses that word and says, I charge you in the sight of God and Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead to preach the word. Why does he say that? Because the word spoken under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit will bring change. So we, as the people of God, have to have an appetite developed for the word of God. Now, this is the thing that I've learned. The more time I spend in the word of God, the hungrier I am for it. The less time I spend in the word of God, the hunger wanes. Now, it's diametrically opposed to our physical. If I go without eating for three, four days, you all know what happens, right? Your body is screaming, I'm hungry. Your spirit is the complete opposite. The less you feed it, the less it cries out. So it takes a discipline of saying, I'm going to stay in the word because why? I don't want to drift off that path. So if that guy with the flashlight would have turned off the the light, even though I had walked two, three hundred yards on that path perfectly, once the light goes off, I'm off. It's very easy to drift off that path. And that's why we must never get tired of the discipline of spending time in his word. We just did a round table 
my oldest and my young son, and we were doing it uh, for a course that they're coming out called the I Am Course. And both my sons said, we remember when we were in high school, we were, had to get up early in the morning and my dad's light was already on and he's reading his Bible. And I didn't realize it, but that spoke to them to where they're now even more disciplined about it than even me. Because they saw, hey, my dad didn't do everything perfectly. My mom didn't do everything perfect, perfectly. But one thing we do know is that the word of God kept them humble enough to say, I'm sorry, when they made mistakes. And this is the thing we want to maintain. You know, I, I have, you know, I've been around the church and I've been traveling all over the world. So I see things from a bird's eye view. And I have seen leaders and I've seen people in the church that stay teachable. And they stay humble. And you know what? They continue to grow. But then I've seen leaders in the church that have no vision and the church doesn't go anywhere. What I have observed in no matter what we do, whether we're in the marketplace, whether we're in healthcare, whether we're in education, is that we stay humble and we keep a vision. And there's something about spending time with God that puts vision inside of you. You know, counsel in the heart of a man is deep waters, the Bible says. But the man or woman of understanding draws it out. That's Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5. Counsel in the heart of a man is deep waters, but the man or woman of understanding draws it out. Now, that's very, very interesting to me. The person of understanding knows how to dry out, draw out the counsel of God. Don't we? What are counselors for? I need help. I need to know what to do. I'm in a situation where I'm really struggling. What do counselors do? They say, well, I advise for you to do this. Well, do you know there is counsel from the Lord? He is called the spirit of counsel. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, right? These are one of the, these are the sevenfold aspects of the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of counsel. And do you know how many times I've run into situations and I said, God, I need, I need counsel. I need to know what to do right now. And do you know, this is why I preface the Holy Spirit. The Bible says... Jesus said, out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, what's an aspect of those? What, what, what's one of the river? What is one of the rivers? Counsel. Understanding. Wisdom. And this he spoke of the spirit that they would receive. Are you following this? He who speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't speak to men. He speaks to God. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. That doesn't mean mysteries like woo-woo. It means hidden counsel, hidden wisdom, hidden understanding. God doesn't hide things from people. He hides things for his elect. So he's not hiding things from us. He's hiding things for us. That's why it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings. We're kings and priests. The glory of Christians to search out a matter. So if we allow the demands upon this life today to keep pulling us, pulling us, pulling us, pulling us, pulling us, pulling us, we don't get what we really need. In the area of life we're called to succeed in. So I have found myself so many times in situations where, God, what do I do? And you know what I do? I begin to pray in the spirit. And then I listen. But listen to me. I look at the Holy Spirit as like a dentist and I'm like the assistant. Okay, now let me, let me, let me, bear with me on this one a little bit. This will help give you a visual. Do you know what the assistant does before the dentist does a root canal? Ooh, God forbid any of us get a root canal. They lay out all the tools on this tray. And the dentist comes in, and I, I've had one of these in my life, and I never want another one again. But he was going, give me this, give me that, give me that, give me that. And he's pointing to all these tools at different times of this procedure saying, I need this now, I need this now. And it was already laid out, right, by the assistant. What happens if the assistant doesn't put out the tools? 
The dentist has nothing to draw from. So this is the importance of staying in the word. So we think I'm going to get the benefit from staying in the word today right at the moment that I'm reading. Yeah, that may happen. But I have found often it's two hours later. Because the Holy Spirit said, I need this right now. And you know what else it does? It keeps the channel open. So these are the disciplines that we, on the hour, don't think is important. But in reality, it's extremely important. It's the foundations. And so, one of the things that I want to I wanna address here this morning is the different positions, postures we can hold as believers. I have, I have learned that there are three life positions that we can take at any time and we can flow in and out of these depending upon the circumstance, but there's one that is better than all the others. The three positions would be a servant, we can be a slave, or we can be a hireling. Now, let me explain this to you. Let's talk about, first of all, the difference between a servant and a slave. A servant gets to. A a, a slave has to. Okay? Do you know when Jesus said, if they want you to take their colt one mile, go two. Why does he say that? He's trying to keep them from becoming slaves. So let me, let's review this. If a Roman soldier comes up to, or Roman soldier or even citizen comes up to me, and I'm a Jewish person, right, back in those days, and I got all my groceries. I got my haagen bars in there. I got, you know, you, you guys know I don't eat haagen but anyway. But I got all my, my milk, my perishables, and, and that guy says to me, I want, you to, I want you to walk my horse one mile. Do you know, by law, I had to do it. I had to put down my groceries, and they're all gonna perish now, and I have to go a mile, and then I gotta come back and get them. That was a, that was a bad deal. And Jesus is saying to them, okay, why do you want to do this feeling like I have to do it when you can do it and get to do it? So you're going to choose if you're going to be the slave slave that has to go the one mile, or you're going to choose if you're going to be the servant that says, I'll go the extra mile. If you're a servant, you're free. If you're a slave, you're in bondage. And you'd be amazed at how many people are in bondage today because they're slaves. They have a slave mentality. The servant does the maximum. The slave does the minimum requirement. So the slave's going to go the one mile. The servant's going to go two. Now the hireling, we, we, we really, really make hirelings sound bad. But really, to be honest with you, the definition of a hireling is not a bad thing. It's a person who serves for merely pay or wages. That's the definition of a hireling. They're motivated to work because they're being paid for it. Now that's not an evil thing. But it's not the highest thing. Because the hireling will work as long as I'm being paid. The servant will work to get the job done. Now, if you look at the life posture of Jesus, the way he came, I want you to notice this. Jesus says in Mark 10, 43 through 45, he says, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the son of man came not to be serve, but to serve others and give his life. So Jesus made it clear. I came, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Now I find it quite interesting that the last illustrated sermon that Jesus left these guys on the earth in the upper room was washing their feet. Now how many of you have ever been to a place in Christianity where you were in a small group and somebody pulled out the basin and the pitcher and they had everybody take their shoes and socks off? Come on, let's be honest. Have you ever had that happen? Did you hate it? Yes, I did. 
And unfortunately, back in college, it was really big. So I got saved in college, right, in my fraternity. And I'm going to all these Bible studies. And man, they pull out these basins. And I'm going, ain't no guy going to touch my feet. And I'd make up some excuse, I'm sorry to say, to get out of there as fast as I could before I had to take my shoes and socks off because I didn't want nobody touching my feet. Okay, now, you know what I'm really happy to hear? I'm happy to hear that I was okay in doing that. Because do you remember Moses put the brazen pole, serpent on the pole, and everybody looked at it, got healed? Do you know that later on they made an idol out of that brazen serpent? If you just read your Bible, you'll find out they made an idol out of it. What Jesus was doing had a significant meaning, and we made an idol out of it. So I'm so glad, because it has no meaning today. Let me explain it. Back in those days, a very wealthy man or one, a very wealthy couple would have a household full of servants. They'd have servants that take care of the animals. They had servants that took care of the kitchen. They had servants that took care of the children. They had servants that took care of other aspects of the home. And you know what? The lowest servant, the bottom servant. So if you, there's 20 household servants, number 20, and it usually was a female, she had a job. You know what her job was? To wash people's, the family's feet and guest feet when they came into a house. Because we got to think about it. Back in those days, roads weren't concrete. They weren't asphalt. They were dirt. Transportation wasn't, must, it wasn't cars, okay? It was horses, donkeys, and camels. And horses, donkeys, and camels don't go to rest stops to go to the bathroom. They do it right on the road. And a lot of people had sandals, and some people even had bare feet. So they're walking on pathways that have animal waste on it. So when they walk into the house, they got to have their feet clean. Now these guys are in an, in, in an upper room, and this upper room was, I mean, this house was so big, this upper room, you can have a staff of 13 people having a full dinner while they're separated from the rest of the family. You gotta understand, this is a good size house and you probably got the 20 or 30 servants. So when all 12 of these guys that Jesus is having dinner with walked into the house just a couple hours earlier, some young female who was the bottom servant of all the servants of this household washed their feet. So when Jesus pulls this thing out and disrobes and puts a towel around it and starts to wash their feet, they're freaking out. And that's why Peter's going, you are not doing this. But I love what Jesus says after he does it. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. I am your Lord, and I am your teacher. And he said, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to, ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. So the last illustrated he's sermon he, re, he shows is that I am a servant. In fact, I am the number one servant of the church. In other words, I'm bottom of the barrel. I'm the one washing your feet. Now, when you stop and think about this, does this change the way we view servanthood? Do the way we, I should say, does this change the way we view authority in the kingdom? Okay, so when, when the Bible says, husband, you're the head of the home, what does that mean? You're the number one servant. You're not the boss of the world. You're not the guy that's supposed to order everybody around while you sit and watch a football game. It means you're the number one servant in the house. Now, that doesn't take away from authority, but it does transform it the way we look at authority. So let's just, let's just get a little more simple here. We have enough money to buy an outfit for a special event. We can buy either an outfit for my wife or an outfit for me. Guess what we're doing? We're buying an outfit for the wife because I am the chief servant. We're going on vacation. She wants to go to the beach. I want to go to the mountains. We're going to the beach because I'm the number one servant. If we live this way, we live like Jesus. 
Are you, are you following me? So, you know, when I used to be in our big church, we had uh, 450 paid staff members. We were one of the best known churches in the United States. And we all had this mentality, one day, we're gonna be on, you know, we're gonna be preachers, we're gonna have our own churches, we're gonna have our own ministries, and then we're gonna arrive. And, and that mentality was so stupid. <laughs> And you know how the Holy Spirit can really address things. So you know what my job was at that church? I took care of all my pastor's needs. So I picked up his dry cleaning. I remember giving two of his kids lessons at the YMCA. I was in the pool with 16 moms going touch Mr. Sun, splash, wee! I'm the only guy with 15 other moms and infants teaching them how to swim. I remember I had to go stud their dog. They had a collie, they wanted the collie to reproduce. I gotta go to this lady's house and I'm watching two dogs make out in front of a lady I've never met before. I'm like, you know, I'd buy their Perrier's. I'd buy, I'd go get their groceries. I'd pick their kids up from school, right? That's my job. I'd pick up their dry cleaning. I'd wash their cars, right? Bring them to the car wash, keep their cars wet. That was my job. The first four and a half years of my ministry, I had left a several thousand dollar a year it took a several thousand dollar year pay cut in engineering to go serve my pastor. And I did that for four and a half years. And I'll be honest with you, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. But I remember I was, was driving my pastor's car to get it cleaned at the car wash like I did, you know, every three, four days. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, son, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. He said, if, and there was a big if, if I promote you, to preaching. He said it'll be a promotion in serving. And I, 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 I'm listening, I'm listening. And then he said this to me. He said, because you mess up now, it's a dry clean shirt. He said, you mess up then, it's lives. He said, lives are much more valuable to me than dry clean shirts or a car. And I realized my whole mentality of leadership was wrong. When I stand on a platform, I realize I have been giving a bigger responsibility to serve. And that if I'm not prepared, and I don't keep my heart prepared, I can really mess this up if I drift. I can really mess this up if I'm not in communion with the Holy Spirit. Because I'm so bombarded by what's coming from the outside, it's going to filter in to the way I serve. And this is why Paul says to Timothy, look, you are to preach the word. Because the time's going to come when they're not going to endure sound teaching. They're going to heap up teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. That's what he goes on to say. So you look at people like me, like Pastor Paul, you look at Pastor Ashley, and you think, oh man, we got a great position. We've got all these people helping us, doing all this stuff. No, 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 no. It's a greater responsibility of serving, is what it is. And our way of serving is a little different. This is why the apostle said, we have a responsibility to preach the word of God. We cannot be doing all the administrative stuff that's going on from the real growth of this church So we're to lay hands on men and call them to serve widows their food. Because why? They realize we have a responsibility. This is our area of serving. Are you following me? Now, to take the position of a servant rather than a slave or a hireling. I want to understand the heart of a servant. And one of the people that I feel exemplifies a servant better than anybody else in the Old Testament is a woman named Rebecca. Okay, so can we read about a Rebecca? All right, now, do you remember the story? Abraham looks at his chief servant and he says, hey, I don't want my son marrying any of these Canaanite women. So I want you to go back and go on a long journey back to where I grew up. And I want you to find a wife for my, I, uh, my son Isaac among my relatives, among my people that I grew up with. Are you, you remember this? So the servant goes on a very long journey and he takes with him 10 camels. 
And these camels are loaded down with treasures. And he makes the very long journey and he comes to the place where Abraham's relatives live. And he makes this prayer. He says, God, let the woman who comes out and not only gives me a drink of water, but also waters all my camels be the one that you've chosen for my master's son, Isaac, to be his, his wife, right? So let's just start reading from Genesis 24, verse 16. Look at this. Rebecca was very beautiful and old enough to be married, but she was still a virgin. She went down to the spring, filled up her jug, and came up again. Running over to her, the servant, this is Abraham's servant, said, please give me a little drink of water from your drug. Yes, my Lord, she answered, have a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. When she had give him, given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran back to the well to draw water for all his camels. That's 10 camels. The servant watched her in silence, wondering whether or not the Lord had given him success in his mission. Then at last, when the camels had finished drinking, and I'm going to stop it right there. So aspect of a servant, number one, servants are willing. Write that down. Servants are willing. How do I know that? Look at Genesis 24, 17 and 18. The guy looks at her and says, please give me a little drink of water from your jug. Watch this. Yes, my Lord, she answered, have a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave her a drink. All right. Notice she has a willing attitude. Are you seeing this? Now, something I've noticed that can happen with people is they start out with the servant's attitude, but when they start getting paid for it, they lose the servant's attitude. In other words, now their willingness is driven by the reward rather than the mere fact of serving. I want to just read this to you before I really go into this. Peter makes the statement, do your work not for mere pay, but from a real desire to serve. So our motivation is not to get the pay or the reward, it is to serve. Are you seeing this? Money can corrupt somebody's heart. I'm not saying it does, but it has the potential. So I wanna make a statement, I want you to write this down. My wife loves this statement. Serving is its own pleasure. It's not motivated from any other reward. If somebody has the heart of a servant, their reward is the serving. Not what I get for serving. Not the recognition, not the pay. It was the reward was getting to serve. Have you ever noticed that when you do something for someone and, get, and you know you're not gonna get anything out of it, do you notice the good feeling that hits you? Isn't that amazing that God created us to release endorphins and serotonin into our body when we do something good for somebody? When you say a kind word to somebody, when you compliment someone, when you go to somebody's house and help them shovel their driveway. Well, I'm from Colorado. You, you, you got to understand, you, you wouldn't have that around here. So you, you go do something for somebody, boy, it just feels good. I, I was preaching in a church back in the 1990s and it was a good sized church. And I remember they had 36 inches of snow. It was Minnesota in a matter of 24 hours. So you know what I did? I went out and shoveled the pastor's driveway. And they, they couldn't believe it. They said, our guest speaker went out and shoveled our driveway. I just heard about it. Now, this is back in the 90s. I just heard about it like two months ago. Somebody said, oh, you know the story I will never forget is you were the guest speaker for the church and you went out and shoveled the pastor's driveway. I thought, gosh, I didn't think anything of it. But you know, I really felt good. I was done shoveling. I thought, ah, that was fun. That was my reward. You see what I'm saying? Are you tracking with me? All right, so serving is its own pleasure. Now, remember I said she was willing? I'm gonna make a statement here. Energy springs forth from desire. In other words, when we're willing, energy comes. Have you ever noticed when you have a teenage son or daughter and you say, go clean your room? Okay, oh, this is so much work. 
But as their friends come over with a basketball and say, let's go play ball, they run to their room, get their gym shorts on, and run out, bye, mom, and they won't even eat lunch. Where did all that energy come from? Willingness. So when our will is engaged, we are energized. Good preaching, John. Amen. Thank you. The willing heart, listen carefully to me, is impelled rather than compelled. I don't want to be around people that are compelled to do something and drag in doing it because they're not, their will's not engaged. I want to be around people who are full of energy because their will is engaged. Good preaching. Our team members, <laughs> they, they've got that, okay? And they've, even got, they've either gotten it through strong encouragement from me or one of our, our directors or, you know, they don't survive on our team. I mean, you should, you should see our, we have prayer meeting every morning from 8 to 8.20. Oh my gosh, you should see our guys pray. Now, it didn't start out that way. But when we first started it right at the beginning of COVID, you could tell people were coming in kind of drowsy, sleepy, all this stuff. But let me tell you now, they're ready. But they took a lot of strong encouragement you know what I'm talking about. A willing heart is agreeable, not disagreeable. Okay. So in other words, a willing heart will always seek to flow with what is being asked or what is needed at the time, not sit there and say, oh, we, we can do it a different way. Oh, it'd be better if we just did this, you know, next week. The willing heart is executing, not excusing. The willing heart has the attitude, it can be done. I've told our team time and time again, don't you ever come back to me and say it can't be done. And only if it's absolutely impossible do you come back and tell me it can't be done. But you better have a better solution. Because we have a can-do attitude because nothing's impossible to those who believe. So don't you ever come back and tell me after one inspection it can't be done. You better seek and find a way to get it done. Because this is the way I serve my pastor. I had a personal policy that I would never tell him something could be done. And if I knew that it really was impossible, then I came back with a better idea for his approval. Still with me? All right, number two, servants excel. So number one, servants are willing. Number two, servants excel. Write that down, all right? Let's, let's, let's look at Rebecca's example. She went down. All right, let's put this up for me. Go ahead. All right, no, 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 no. The scripture, the scripture. Oh. Guys, it's Genesis 24, 17 through 19. It's not, not in the PowerPoint. It's in my PowerPoint. Did it get left out, Grayson? Genesis 24, 17 through 19. Just find it and give it to me. There should have been another scripture before that picture. All right, you're just going to have to listen. I guess, I, the, well, I see it up there. She went down. There we go. Thank you. All right, she went down. Now watch this. Read carefully. She went down to the spring, filled up her jug, and came up again. Please remember that, okay? Running over to her, the servant said, please give me a little drink of water for your, from your jug. Yes, my Lord. She answered, have a drink. That's what was asked for, correct? Correct? The only thing he asked for was a drink of water. All right, so she did what she was asked for, and she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. When she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have enough to drink. So there's the second mile. She was asked for a drink, but then she saw a need. And without being asked, she met the need, so she excels. Are you following this? Now, here's what we don't understand as Westerners. A camel that makes a long journey, once the journey is complete, because they were very arid journeys a lot of times, a camel after a journey can drink anywhere from 30 to 50 gallons of water. Did you hear what I just said? This guy's got 10 camels. 
So let's go with the lower, lower one, 30 gallons. If you multiply 30 gallons by 10, what do you get? Six, uh, 300 gallons, right? Now, a typical carrying container of water would be about five gallons. <laughs> do you understand how many containers it would take? 60. 60 times five gallon is 300 gallons. Now, do you notice that the scripture says she went down and then she came up again? There's two types of wells back in those days. First well, now we can see the picture. The first well is the one where you let down the bucket and you pull it up. The second well is one that had steps that went down to the spring. We already know which well she's, she's dealing with. She went down and she came up. Do you understand that this woman voluntarily makes 60 trips down that sp to that spring and carries up five gallons of water to give all those camels a drink? All he asked her for was a drink of water. So 95% of her labor was, was what was what she was not asked to do, but rather she saw the need and fulfilled it. It's remarkable when you think about it. He didn't even ask her. She just did it. She excelled. Are you tracking with me? I don't, I, I, I know it's the grace of God because it was so contrary to my nature. I mean, I, I remember my mom used to weep when I was a teenager saying, you are so selfish, right? So I got saved and my mom was very upset about it. Wouldn't even invite me to my dad's retirement party because she was concerned I was gonna preach to the people. <laughs> And I remember three years later, she looked at me, she said, you've really changed. And I believe what she saw that it changed in me, I went from being a very self-centered young man to a man who had the ability to now serve because he had the character of Jesus, right? So when I got this position, I thought, I'm gonna excel in this position. And there are stories after, I remember my pastor, he, he knew that my position was the most coveted position because not only did I take care of his needs, I took care of all the guest speakers. And we had every guest speaker known coming to our church. I mean, from T.L. Osborne to Lester Summerall to Marilyn Hickey to Oral Roberts, you know, and I'm the guy picking these people up, taking them to dinner, hosting them, right? So he knew that this position was coveted because everybody wanted to be around Oral Roberts and all these others really well-known communicators of the word of God of our day. And he tested me. I mean, he, he, he was hard on me, really hard on me for about nine months. And I just kept smiling and just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember one time, you know, uh, his son was at, foot, I think it was football or soccer practice. And they lived like, they lived an hour away, or excuse me, a half hour away from the, the practice field. And I, I remember the, the husband saying to the wife, gosh, I'd love to take you to dinner, but we, we gotta get our son home so he can do his homework. And I, I w it was after hours. It was like 5.30 in the evening. And I said, I'll take him home. I'll take him to your house. And my pastor looked at me and he said, you do that? Because he knew I'd have to travel 30 minutes and then back 30 minutes and it would be another hour of me doing something. I said, absolutely. And I remember his whole attitude toward me changed after that because he realized that I was really in this to serve. And there, so there was this time right after that that one of our, our guest speakers who for our conference, he came and it was a very cold time in Dallas and he had all his winter clothes because it was one of those really, really, like you had a really bad time cold this year here in Tulsa. It was one of those times. And so 
you know, the speaker came. The wife had her big, thick fur coat. He had his big coat. They had all their sweaters and all this. But they were going straight from our conference to Hawaii. And we were at dinner on the last night of the conference. And he was kind of like, gosh, we've got to drag all that stuff. We've got to drag all that stuff to Hawaii. And I said, no, you don't. And he said, what do you mean? I said, just give me all your winter stuff and I'll keep it in my apartment until you get back and I'll meet you at the airport and you can fly back up because he was from Tulsa. I said, you can just fly back up to Tulsa. He goes, John, John, you don't want to do that. I said, why not? I said, well, he said, my flight lands at DFW at 5.30 in the morning a week from Saturday. I said, so? He said, you will have to get up at like 4, 4.30 in the morning on a Saturday morning to come and bring my winter stuff to me. I said, so? No problem. And, you know, I, what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying here is I just looked for needs and met them. And it's interesting. The reward that would come from the endorphins and the serotonin, the enjoyment of getting to do these things. Are you following me? Now, I didn't know that there were rewards involved, and I didn't do it for the rewards. But I remember, you know, back in those days, this is really crazy. Big thing was to have an eel skin briefcase. I mean, you may remember this, uh, Paul, but I mean, it was like, this is, okay, this is mid-80s, all right? <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, for laughing, because you know what I'm talking about. Man, if you had an eel br skin briefcase, you were just, you had it, Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm sorry. You have no comprehension if you're under 40 about this, okay? But I remember, you know, I went to get him at, at 5.30 in the morning, hand his luggage to him, and I said, oh, you bought an eel skin briefcase. That's amazing, right? Right? And he's smiling. He goes, that's your eel skin briefcase. I'm like, what? He said, I bought that for you. I want you to have it. I didn't do that that morning to get an eel skin briefcase. I had no idea he was going to bring it but, it, but it, but he gave it to me. You know, if you look at Rebecca, she had no idea. All 10 of those camels had nothing but treasures on it for the woman that was going to water all those camels. And she had no idea the whole time she's watering those camels. They got 10, 10 loads of treasures, gold, silver, jewelry. And she doesn't even realize that she's watering all those camels and all those are gonna be hers. This is something I've noticed that God will always, always reward a servant. But if you look for that reward, you're gonna do it with a different motivation. See, here's the thing you gotta keep before you. Serving is its own pleasure. Serving is its own reward. Anything you get on top of that, great. But it's interesting how God will always see to it that it gets done. All right, servants, number three. Servants are swift. Everybody say swift. Okay, watch this. She quickly... Everybody say quickly, lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. Now look at this. I'm going to go to the 20th verse. She quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran. Are you seeing this? Ran. She is not a teenager cleaning her room. Ran back to the well to draw water for all his camels. <laughs> this is crazy. Now, money today is not people's most important commodity. Did you know that? What's more important than money? Time. Have you ever called your credit card company? Punch one for this. Punch two for that. Punch three for this. Punch four for that. Punch five for that. Then you punch the number five, punch one for this, punch two for this, punch three for that. So you punch three, punch one for this, punch two for that. You punch two, and then they come out and go, oh, due to increasing volume of calls, we will be with you in 10 to 12 minutes. And what do you do? Boom, I am done with this. Why? Because time, you ever been in a line? That that line was long, and you said, this ain't worth it. You wanted what was at the end of that line, but you didn't want it. I mean, I, my, how many times my wife has said, I need a Starbucks. 
and we're at the airport, and we look at the line, and it's like two blocks long. And you go, I don't want it that bad. Why? Because time was more important than her coffee, and her coffee is really important to her. <laughs> Serving, have you ever gone to a restaurant, and they take forever? Do you go back? No. So serving that is slow is not serving at all. Write that down. Serving that is delayed and slow is not serving at all. You with me? Okay, let's go to the next one. Servant's honor. I mean, we all know this scripture. Well, let's, let's read this. She said, yes, my Lord. Notice she calls him my Lord. This is a total stranger. She answered, I have a, have a drink. She quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. So honor is displayed in words and action. So she does it quickly. She says, sir, and he's a complete stranger. Now, it could be understandable if he was maybe a leader in her community and she behaved this way. But this guy is a total stranger from another land. And she honors him. You dishonor the person you're seeking to serve when you let them know how much it took you to do what you did for them. Because all you're doing is heaping feelings on them of almost guilt. Example, um, we were in a conference. It was a similar conference to this week where many speakers were coming in. The speaker that was in our conference uh, used to serve as an associate for a world-renowned evangelist who went to, he, he left the earth in, in the 1970s, but this guy was one of his, um, his chief assistants. And my pastor happened to love that evangelist. And so my pastor, when this guy came, my pastor had him at his house just asking him questions after questions after questions about this great evangelist that passed away in the 1970s. And I remember my wife are in, my wife are in bed and we're sound asleep, right? And my phone rings. And when I, pick up the, when I start to pick up the phone, I notice <laughs> it's one o'clock in the morning. And I, I said, hello? And it was my pastor and he said, John, he said, uh, we're done talking and could you come in? bring him back to the hotel. I said, absolutely. I'll be there in 30 minutes because I was 30 minutes away. So I got there at 1.30. They were still talking a little bit more. They talked for another 15, 20 minutes. So we left about 10 till two. And I got him back to the hotel and I remember I got back into my bed at 2.30 in the morning. What my pastor didn't know and to this day doesn't know and it was my intention that he would never know is that I had an airport run for the next speaker that I had to get up at 4.45 in the morning to get him because he had a very early flight. He, he took a red eye. He was coming from overseas, I think. So I basically got to bed at 2.30 and my alarm went off at 4.45 in the middle of a conference and I never told him. Why? Because I didn't want to dishonor him. If I told him Oh, um, uh, I, I, I'm getting up at 445. Is there any way you can have somebody else do this? <clears throat> He's never going to want me to do that. He doesn't need to know. I'm just going to get the job done. Because I really honored my pastor. So who you honor is who you value. And who you value is who you will give what's precious to you to, and that's your time and your energy. You tracking with me? You still with me? Okay. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. <laughs> I love this. And whoever honors me honors the one who sent me. Whoever honors God's messenger because he is God's messenger, will share in his reward. In other words, the reward he brings, you get. The reward he carries from heaven, you get. 
And whoever honors a good or welcomes a good man because he is a good man will share in his reward. You can be sure that whoever gives even a drink of cold water to one of, these little, uh, one of the least of these, my followers, because he is my follower, will certainly receive a reward. So do you notice that Jesus is, and, and to welcome, this word welcome actually means who it receives, it means honors. So Jesus is saying, when you understand that even the least person in this church When you honor them, welcome them, receive them, serve them, you're serving me. I I will never, ever forget, um, I I was driving my pastor's car to to get it cleaned again. He had the top of the line Mercedes at the time. And there's a construction guy, you know the guys that have the stop and slow signs? There's... Construction guy, he's got the stop up, and I'm the first car in the line. And the guy looked pretty, pretty, pretty little deranged. <laughs> he looked really dirty, had holes in his jeans, and nobody ever thought of holes in jeans to be designer jeans in those days. So these were holes from not having enough money to get a pair of jeans, okay? And I remember the Holy Spirit saying, How valuable is that man? He said, Is that man more valuable than the car you're driving? And I gave my religious answer. I said, yeah, yeah. Still not really knowing where he's taking this. I said, yeah. He said, so how valuable is he? And I'm thinking, and then the words come to me, Jesus saying, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He said, so he brought that scripture to me. He said, so that man is obviously more valuable than the car you're driving. In fact, if he had all the wealth of this entire planet and he gave up his soul for it, he's made an unprofitable deal because his soul's worth more than all the wealth in all the world. I went, oh my gosh. Because you know, you don't you don't make an unprofitable deal is if you have a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house and I pay you two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for it. I've made a bad deal. I've made an unprofitable deal, right? Because now I'm stuck. So he said, if that man was to give his life for all the wealth in the world, and I started thinking about all the wealth in the world. I mean, just the gross world product, last I checked, was like 35 trillion, right, a year. If, if, he, if he gave his soul for all the wealth in the world, he'd make an unprofitable deal, which means that his soul is more valuable than all the wealth in the world. I said, ooh, that's pretty amazing. He said, so what's the man's value? And I said, I don't know. And then I heard the scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave. And I went, oh my gosh. God gave Jesus, and if it would have been just for that one man, he still would have given him. Now God doesn't make unprofitable deals. Are you tracking with this? So if God gave Jesus and Jesus' value is greater than that man's value, then God has made an unprofitable deal and they'll never make an unprofitable deal. So you know what that means? God values that man who's holding that sign, who looked deranged, as much as he valued Jesus. Oh, oh my gosh. And I'll prove it to you. Jesus says in John 17, he said, Father, show them you love them as much as you love me. As much. So that means that woman who's ringing up your groceries, her value to God is equal of Jesus. Or else he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die for her. Does that show you how valuable people are? That's why I can't take lightly what I do. Because I'm not doing dry clean shirts. I'm being entrusted with people who God greatly values. Like as much as Jesus. So if I mess up, This is why the Bible says, be not many of you teachers, knowing we're going to incur a much stricter judgment. (laughs) 
that causes me to fear in a really healthy way. I'll, I'll never forget. Can I share a story with you? I think I got a couple more minutes, right? I'm preaching a conference up in the northern part of the country. And I had written the beta Satan like seven years earlier. Right? Are you tracking with me? So now I'm like five books ahead of the beta Satan, right? And I'm just writing this new message. And it's so in me, right? Right? It's just like when you're writing on something, like you explode when you preach, right? (laughs) Okay? Because it's just in you, right? And I remember, you know, usually when I go to a conference or a church, I kind of sense the Lord's pleasure on a message. Well, that morning, I didn't sense the Lord's pleasure. I woke up and I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to preach the bait of Satan. So I'm wrestling with this because I'm actually writing in the hotel room and man, it's so good when I'm writing and I want to preach on this, right? So (laughs) um, they pick me up, they take me to conference, the green room's got leaders in it. Oh man, they're traveling from, we just heard of a family is traveling, you know, two hours just to come to this meeting tonight. We're here in this, you know, and, and, and oh man, I'm just sitting there going, I don't want to preach the beta Satan. I want to preach on what I'm writing on. That's seven books ago. Man, these people probably read beta Satan. They're traveling two hours and they're going to hear me preach a message I wrote on seven years ago. I can't do it. I, 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 I can't do it. Sorry. My mind's going to go with the music. Okay, so I'm so sorry. Most preachers can do it. I'm, I guess this is a handicap for me. Okay, so, so I, I'm sitting there going, oh, man, man. These people have traveled all these hours. The beta Satan's a national, or a national bestseller. They probably read this book. They're going to be so disappointed. I'm, I'm dealing with this, right? So then I go to the meeting and all the people are like, you know, great worship, great praise. Everybody's excited. All right. And I get up and you know what I do? I preach the message I'm writing on. Next morning, I'm not kidding. Next morning, I get up and I thought I was going to die. I am so heavy. And I remember, I didn't get out of bed. I rolled out straight to my knees. I said, God, something's really wrong. He said, I heard him say, you didn't preach the bait of Satan last night. And I went, God, I'm so sorry. I repent. I repent. I ask you to forgive me. Lord, I'm so sorry. Right? But that weight's not lifting. That feeling of like I'm going to die is not lifting. I'm like, what's going on? So I go to the airport and I fly to the West Coast. And I remember the flight's delayed. So I'm walking around the airport feeling like I'm dying. <laughs> what is going on? Why do I feel like I'm going to throw up? Why do I feel so heavy? I get on the plane the whole ride out to the West Coast, California. I'm like, oh my gosh. So now we're circling San Diego and we're about, we're starting to land. And that heaviness, that feeling like I'm going to die, just lifts off me. And I say, God, I asked you to forgive me this morning. Why did you let me feel the weight of my disobedience all day long? And he said, son, because there was a pastor in that service last night who needed to hear what I entrusted to you on the bait of Satan, and he didn't get it. And he said, I want you to know how serious your disobedience was. It was costly. He said, this is a new city, now obey me. Can I tell you something? I have never, ever disobeyed like that again. Because everybody in that meeting, you know what they said? Because I'm telling you, when I was preaching that night, people were standing on their feet going, yeah, right? If you ask all those people, was it a great meeting? Oh, yeah, it was a great meeting. Was it an anointing meeting? Oh, yeah, it was an anointing meeting. They still think it to this day probably it was a great meeting. But they're going to find out the judgment seat. And I'm going to have to face that pastor possibly and say, I'm so sorry I didn't obey God. I was carrying what you needed that night. He entrusted it to me, and I disobeyed him. I'm so sorry.
I don't know how I got off on that, but that's how important that is. All right, I better wrap this up. Where are we at? (laughs) Servants work hard. A servant works enthusiastically until the job's done. The hireling works to fulfill the required hours. Servants don't quit. Look at this statement again. She said, I'll get water for your camels too until they've drunk their fill. She promptly emptied her jug into the trough and ran back into the well to fill it and she kept at it until she had watered all the camels. Can I tell you something really quick and then I'm gonna try to wrap this up because back in those days when I was serving, I didn't realize what the Holy Spirit was doing. He was preparing me for what he was gonna trust me with. Because God found me faithful in taking care of the dry cleaning, taking care of the car, doing always the best job, going beyond, excelling all of that, what happens is, is he's now going to trust him with something a little bit more. It's called writing messages. What people don't understand is there's probably about 400 hours in every one of those books. What people don't understand is that I will go over and over and over and over a chapter eight to 16 times before I say it's done. Listening inside. Laboring, I have labored over one sentence for literally 15, 20 minutes because it's gotta be said right. Where did that begin when I was taking care of the dry cleaning? My mind will go, it's good enough. My heart goes, "Uh uh-uh. It's not quite right. It's not, I'm, I don't resonate with it yet. That's the way we gotta handle the way we serve. So whether it's hospitality, whether it's giving a backpack to a kid, whether it's talking to somebody about Jesus, servants keep working until the job's done. Can I... Um, I was shooting for 11.45. Is that all right, Pastor Paul? Is that good? Okay. I'm gonna show you something interesting. I want you to walk with me through this. You remember this guy named John Mark in the Bible? Everybody say John Mark. All right, watch this. Acts 13, verse five. There in the town of Salamis, they went to a Jewish synagogue and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. So John Mark is called to serve Paul and Barnabas as his assistant. Are you seeing this? Now look at, the next, look at the next verse. Paul and his companions, it's not the next verse, but it's 13th verse. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. John went as an assistant, but after the first city of probably persecution, he said, that I can't handle this anymore, and he left. Now John Mark is Barnabas' cousin. Everybody say Barnabas. Barnabas. All right? Now, this is amazing what what you're about to see. If we go back to the beginning, we notice that in Acts 13, verse 1, Barnabas and Saul were among the the two that were called to what? To be prophets and teachers in the church. If you notice, the Bible lists Barnabas first, Saul second. And then if you look at verse 2, it says, The Holy Spirit said... Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work which I have commanded them. Don't notice Barnabas is listed first. Look at verse seven. They go down to the first place to preach. The governor invited not Saul and Barnabas, but Barnabas and Saul. Do you see that? Okay. Now we go to the very next place where John Mark leaves them. Obviously, this is my cousin, and I don't like how upset you are, Paul, at my cousin. So Barnabas probably chooses the side of his cousin who quit Can I show you all the references later after this? Many Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed followed Paul and Barnabas. This is the first time that now Paul is listed first. Then Paul and Barnabas. They incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas. Are you seeing this? The church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem. They sent them to Antioch and Syria with Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. Do you see how now it's gone from Barnabas and Saul to Paul and Barnabas? Do you see that? And it happens after John Mark leaves. Now watch this, Acts 15. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in every town where we preach the word of the Lord and let us find out how they are getting along. 
Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them. But Paul did not think it was a right to take him. Why? Because he quit. Because he had not stayed with them to the end of their mission, but had turned back and left them in Pamphylia. There was a sharp argument and they separated. Barnabas took Mark and sailed off for Cyprus while Paul chose Silas and left, commanded by, commended by the believers to take care uh, to, to, to the care of the Lord's grace. You never hear about Barnabas again. You don't. That's the last time you hear about Barnabas. Now it's Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas. Barnabas obviously chose family over the service, over the servanthood, the lack of servanthood of Mark. And so God said, fine. It was Barnabas and Saul. Now, Barnabas, you're gonna be over here. You're still gonna work for me, but we're gonna focus in on Paul and Silas. Now, you know what's really interesting is obviously John Mark got a better attitude because look what Paul said much, much later. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark, that is John Mark, with you when you come for he will be helpful for me in ministry. So in other words, John Mark changed, but because Barnabas chose the, the, the servant who quit because he was family over the importance of the work of the kingdom, God said, okay, I'll focus on Paul and Silas now. It started with Barnabas and, and Paul, but I'm gonna focus now on Paul and Silas. Servants don't quit. And seven, final one, servants fulfill their destiny. Just look at this one scripture. Those who have served well, everybody say served well, gain an excellent standing and a great boldness in their faith in Jesus Christ. And I'll never forget the day I preached at Bethel's first, first conference we preached for Bethel. This was back when Bethel was huge and, I mean, known by everybody. And Lisa and I, we had preached for uh, the conference. And I remember being on the plane with Bill Johnson. And he said, John, the authority you carry in the spirit is mind-blowing. He said, you have obviously passed some authority tests. And what is the passing of an authority test? It's when you choose to serve even when all hell is breaking out against you. John Mark left. Barnabas chose the guy who left because he was family. Paul chose the mission of the kingdom. There are tests that we go through in life and these tests are not bad tests, they're actually good tests. When we pass these tests, blessed is the man that endures the trial for he gets what? The crown of life. What comes with a crown? Authority. When we pass these serving tests, there is a greater measure of kingdom authority that comes on our lives. This is what God wants for every single one of you. He wants you to walk in that authority. He wants to be able to trust you with that authority. I didn't give a gun to my son when he was five years old. I gave a gun to my son when he was 18 after he passed several tests of maturity. God is no different. There are people that have positions but don't have the authority to carry the positions. Why? Because those positions were given by men and not by God. Those positions were gained by manipulation. They were not given by God. They don't have the authority. You, I, both, I just opened up a whole nother can of worms we could go for an hour on. But did you get something out of this today? Because we're out of time. Did you get something out of this? Amen.